The destroyer has long been the workhorse of modern navies. The newest and most sophisticated version of this warship is the U.S. Navy's Burke-class destroyer. With its advanced weapons platform and state-of-the-art radar systems, these ships are poised to dominate the seas for decades to come. Fierce naval clashes of battleship against battleship are an iconic image of past wars. Today, the U.S. Navy's fleet of nuclear carriers hold the front line during combat at sea. While the carriers get most of the attention in contemporary warfare, it is the destroyers that form the backbone of the modern fleet. In today's Navy, there are three types of surface warships. The frigate, the destroyer, and the cruiser. The smallest and most economical of the three is the frigate. They carry fewer weapons and less sophisticated electronic sensors than the larger destroyers and cruisers. On the high end of the scale are the cruisers such as the U.S. Navy's Ticonderoga-class Aegis cruisers. The Aegis-class cruisers are especially well-suited to defending carrier battle groups against air attack, often called the shield of the fleet. Cruisers are larger than destroyers since they contain additional command and control facilities aboard to allow senior naval officers to coordinate the actions of other ships in a battle group. The destroyer fits in between the frigate and the cruiser. The modern destroyer is a well-balanced design. It is capable of carrying out a wider range of missions than frigates, while at the same time carrying weapons that give it capabilities approaching those of cruisers. Wherever the fleet commander wants to use us, we can go. If he needs us in a strike role to strike hundreds of miles ashore, we can do that. If he needs us to go perform an anti-submarine mission with a Lamps Mark III helicopter, we can do that as well. If he needs us to go against an air threat, an Exocet cruise missile, for instance, or any other type of cruise missile or manned aircraft, we have a very robust capability there. We can strike surface targets. We can shoot gunfire support in support of ground troops. You name the naval mission area, and we can perform it of a surface combatant. The name destroyer stems from this ship's traditional role, torpedo boat destroyer. Today, the small torpedo boat is no longer a significant threat to surface warships. Other types of vessels have replaced it. The most deadly torpedo boat today is the submarine. And destroyers like the R. Lee Burke are designed to combat the undersea threat. Above the surface, the anti-ship missile has replaced the torpedo as the newest danger. This requires a change in the balance of work, a legendary World War II destroyer commander. During the fighting in the Pacific, Burke commanded Destroyer Squadron 23 and won several key naval engagements with the Japanese fleets, including the Battle of Cape St. George in November 1943. Burke went on to play a prominent role in shaping the post-war U.S. Navy. Commissioned on July 4, 1991, the DDG-51 R. Lee Burke was the first ship in a new class of destroyers. Among the ships in this class is the DDG-67 USS Cole, which was brought to the world's attention in October of 2000, when it was attacked by terrorists and 17 sailors were killed. Though their missions remain much the same, 
The ships of the Burke class are dramatically different from the destroyers Admiral Burke commanded in World War II. They are more than four times heavier than a World War II destroyer, with the latest version displacing over 9,000 tons. These destroyers represent many new approaches in naval ship design, even compared to destroyers from only a decade earlier. One of the most striking changes from earlier destroyer designs is its hull shape. Destroyers have traditionally been long and narrow. The Burke's designers took another approach. We have a very unique relationship uh, in naval architectural terms, which is our length to beam ratio. For a, a ship of our length, we're very, very wide in the beam. And what that translates to is enhanced stability. We may not be the fastest ship on the ocean, in a flat, calm sea, but we're probably the fastest ship in the ocean in a very heavy sea. That stability lends to just a more comfortable ride in the ship. It's good for the people, it's good for the equipment, it's good for morale. The R. Lee Burke was the first American warship in many years to use this new hull configuration. Other warships, including those of most other navies, still retain the more traditional proportions. Operational experiences of the Burke class confirm the advantages of this new design. A fairly significant storm that had just come through, creating 18 to 22 foot waves. The escort ship that we had was a, a Knox class frigate. They could not physically go, th go through the area that we were in due to the high sea state, high winds, and just the rolling of the ship was creating a dangerous environment for the crew. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't uh, eventually come to that point too. But in 22-foot seas, the ship is taking maybe 8 to 10 degree rolls and can maintain 20 to 25 knots indefinitely. And that's, uh, that's a lot more than a lot of other ships can take. Besides its unique hull shape, the Burke also incorporates other significant changes in naval architecture, one being a return to steel construction. Destroyers of the Second World War were made of steel. By the 1960s and 1970s, steel was being replaced by aluminum. The switch in materials was due to the increasing weight of radars and other sensors, high up in the masts which made the ships top-heavy. Aluminum was an excellent alternative to steel, since it offered strength at a lower weight. But it had its disadvantages in some respects, particularly in the case of battle damage and fires. The designers of the R. Lee Burke wished to return to steel construction and at the same time retain the many advanced electronic systems which have become essential to all modern warships. Well, what we've done on board R. Lee Burke was we've taken a lot of the vital spaces, taken them out of the superstructure, moved them down into the hull itself, and therefore we can afford to have steel topside. So you, you basically take your weight, relocate it from top down, and then you can afford to have more, more weight topside. Plus we've increased the beam of the ship so the ship won't be as top heavy or prone to rolls. It's a very stable platform on top of it. The Burke has a much more compact design than its predecessors. Its superstructure is sleeker and less cluttered than previous designs. And its architectural innovations make it more survivable in combat. The most obvious change in warship design since the Second World War is the physical impression of the ship. World War II destroyers bristled with guns. A typical destroyer would be armed with four or more turreted five-inch guns. And there would be dozens of smaller anti-aircraft guns. Burke destroyers seem to be nearly devoid of weapons. The only weapon immediately obvious is the five-inch gun on the bow. Appearances are deceiving, however, as these ships contain more effective firepower than any World War II warship. Burke-class destroyers carry a variety of missiles. SM-2 standard missiles for surface-to-air attack. Harpoon anti-ship missiles for over-the-horizon surface threats. VLA missiles for anti-submarine warfare and Tomahawk subsonic cruise missiles for land attack. Should any 